full portion of the Word of God, 1 Timothy. While you're turning, let me tell you about a conversation that I sort of became a part of before the service this evening. Several of our people were gathered and talking in the hallway, and they were just rejoicing in their spirit about what God has done and does do in their lives here at Langston. One of them said, I was saved as a teenager, but I was never really a Christian. Now before you run past that, what that simply means, as she described it, was that I knew Christ, but I did not know how to live in the way that he taught. And went on then to say, I've learned more about the Bible and what God expects of me since I've been at Langston than I did in my whole life. She said, I'm an old, and this is a quote, I'm an old woman, but I'm a young Christian. A lot of us would qualify because many of us have been in church but we've not been in Christ. And there's a world of difference of having made a profession and possessing the wonders of the infilling of the Spirit of God. If you wanted to ask your pastor, don't you answer. If you wanted to ask your pastor anything, what would you ask him? This letter is Paul's word to a young preacher, to Timothy, who is on assignment as pastor of the church at Ephesus. You'll remember that it was at Ephesus that Paul founded a church with a couple by the name of Aquila and Priscilla. You'll remember that it was at Ephesus that there was a great center of worship of the moon goddess, Diana. Somebody had seen a meteor falling from the sky and they found a little piece of that rock and turned it into a god or goddess. And they made statues to Diana. And the whole city was a part of that. And now they are confronted with the claims of Jesus Christ and the change that has come to the city on one occasion caused a riot. Paul stayed there in that city longer than any other in his travels. He loved the church at Ephesus. But now his missionary zeal has driven him to other places. And he's writing now to this young preacher, Timothy, that he's left. And what I think he's doing is that he's answering some questions that Timothy must have had in his own mind and warning him about some things that were going on lest the church at Ephesus fall apart and die. Did you know that churches die? Did you? When I first moved to Horry County, I tried to explore the area. I wanted to know what this was all about. And one day I drove down toward Georgetown and, uh, and decided, let's just take a tour. And I'd heard about Plantersville. I thought there was a town out there. Uh, and so, <laughs> so I turned there at, at Plantersville and, start, and here was a church on the right side of the road. Have you ever been there? It's an old Episcopal church. They've got some of the most fantastic antiques. Now, Baptists don't steal, remember? Don't you go down there and break in. But they have got some of the most fabulous antiques in that place. They must be 300 years or more old. And at that time, the building was in disarray. They have since gone in and cleaned it up a little bit. But I, I've, I'm fascinated by things like that. And we stopped and peered through the window and tried to see what we could and, and uh, looked at the structure and the way that it was built and tried to see where they had made improvements through the year. 
But I knew they didn't have church there. Well, I've tried to find out a little bit more about it. And through the years, some people have come in and they have, have refurbished the building and they have a service down there once a year. But it's the church that died. If you go on down the road just a little bit further, there is the facade of what used to be a fantastic church building. The front of the building, the belfry is still there. There was a fire, it has burned, and the rest of it is gone. That's all that remains is just the front of the church. And you can walk and see where the corners of the building were. And there's the cemetery over there of those people who were the early settlers of that part of, the, of this uh, world. And there are some fantastic names that tie themselves to the political scene of the early days of South Carolina. But it's a dead church. It no longer exists. A friend of mine was telling me about a church in Alabama. It was a, a building that had been structured and built out at the edge of town. In the suburban area, it grew to be a large church, seated over a thousand, and was very active and involved. And then something happened. And people began to turn on each other. You know it was a Baptist church. <laughs> and they began to gnaw at one another. And some left. And then others left. And the pastor left. And they called another pastor. And more people just continued to pull away. And they had a service one day and invited my friend, a director of missions, to be a part of the service. And it was one of the strangest services ever held in a Baptist church. For it was a funeral of the church. And when the service was concluded, they had sung some songs. They had talked about what it used to be. And then they called the DOM, the director of missions, to the platform. And the deacon, the only deacon that was left, handed the keys to the church to him and said, as of now, this church no longer exists and we're giving you the keys to the building and the deed to the property. And he said, I know how to start churches, but I don't know how to bury a church. Churches die. The church at Ephesus, apparently there's some things going on We'll see some of that as we make our way through. And the church is close to dying. I drove by a church with some of our people just a few weeks ago and pointed out to them that their pastor had just left. They're running about a dozen in attendance now in one of the fastest growing regions of this county. Maybe the fastest growing region in this county. But the church is just a few years at best away from closing its doors. The North American Mission Board says that in the next 18 years, 50% of the churches in America will close their doors and go out of business. We're in trouble. The church at Ephesus was in that kind of a condition. And Paul is writing to young Timothy whom he has left as pastor. Let's just read a little bit before I come and begin to comment. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I, beth I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith. So do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and out of a good conscience and out of faith unfeigned. From which some, having swerved, having turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. But we know that the law is good 
if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured pe persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to the life to, to life everlasting, now under the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenius and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Thus reading the first chapter of this book of First Timothy. Now in this splendid commentary on this pastoral epistle, it is said that there are no letters in the New Testament which give a more vivid picture of the growing church. In this letter we see the problems of a church which is a little island in a sea of paganism. These letters have an interest all their own and the more one studies them, the more interesting they become and they speak more directly to our situation and condition. Dr. William Barclay, great servant of God, as he wrote about this letter. But now let's come back and look at it little by little. And see with me, first of all, who is the writer. He says, I am Paul. Don't run past that, for that is not his given name. His given name is Saul, a Jew. Paul is his Christian name. Saul means big man. Paul means little man. Paul says, I'm nothing. I thought I was somebody till I met Jesus. And when I met Jesus, I decided and knew that there's nothing good in me. And all that I am, I owe to him. And so he's the big man. And I'm the little man. I'm his servant. So his name, Paul. And then he affirms his office. He says, I am an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now this word apostle simply means that he is an ambassador, one who is sent by the Lord. You will notice that he has said as we continue to read in verse 12 that it was Jesus who put him into the ministry. For those of you who do not know, every time there is an examination of a person who is going to be ordained into the gospel ministry, Ministers gather together and question them about their relationship with God, about their call to ministry. And folks, I want you to know there's a lot of people who were daddy called or mama called or who turned to this because it was a honorable profession. But those who are called that way never make an impact for God. And unless a person is called of Jesus, They'll quit when the going gets tough. And by the way, if you don't know it, it gets tough when you try to lead pre uh, a church. And so he says to this young man, I want you to know that I am called of God. 
It was on the Damascus Road. Now, he doesn't give us that testimony right here. But Paul delighted in giving his testimony of when he came to know Jesus Christ as his personal Savior and Lord. And you've heard me over and over recite how that I, on a Wednesday night, came to know Jesus Christ as my Savior. I can tell you who was there. I can tell you where it happened. I know what went on. I know the prayer I prayed. I know the change that God brought into my life. I knew the first person that I wanted to tell that I'd become a Christian was my best friend Pee Wee. And I told him the next day that Jesus had made a change in my life. I wish I could tell you that I walked with the Lord faithfully, godly, day after day for all of my life, but I cannot be honest and tell you that was the truth, for there was a time when I walked away and backslid and, and brought shame upon the name of God. But I'm going to tell you that there came a day when God put a snare in my path and put a hook in my heart and turned me around and set my feet back in the center of the pathway. He anointed me with grace from on high he called me to the gospel ministry and I said Lord not only am I willing but I'm ready I surrendered to preach on Sunday night quit my job on Monday morning and started making arrangements to enroll in college and move my family so that I could get prepared to preach the word of God hey I'm excited if you don't know it about being a preacher I'm excited about being a Christian but I thank God that he put me into the ministry do you know where you were when you got saved was anybody here saved on Halloween? Well, I'm not surprised. Was anybody here saved on Christmas? Well, I am a little surprised. Somebody ought to get saved on Christmas. I mean, that's the birthday of the Lord. And see, we have worship service on Christmas Day here at Langston Baptist Church. And I know that some people think that I'm odd and I'm stiff and I'm too straight and that that's a day for the family. Who told you that lie? That's the birthday of the king. Yeah. And we ought to worship him. And we'll be here. I hope you will be. I will be on Christmas Day. Matter of fact, I'm studying and praying now about what I'm going to tell you on Christmas Day. And I pray that you'll be here. When were you saved? Somebody stand up right now. She'll stand up and tell the rest of us when you got saved. What went on? November 22nd, 1962. Amen. Where were you? Where were you? In Greensboro. Greensboro, North Carolina. All right. Who, was, who led you to the Lord? Uh, uh, Dick Andrews. Dick Andrews. Elder, elder in the church. Elder in the church. And Joe Westerly and a plumber preached that night. How about that? So a plumber preached and an elder led you to Jesus. And God cleaned out all the pipes and put a new man in your heart. Amen. <laughs> Bless God. Isn't that exciting? Did Nancy get saved before you did? Did Nancy get saved before? Same night. All right. Who else got saved? <laughs> There's a lady that did stand up and tell us where. Right here. Amen. Are you sad that you got saved? Absolutely not. No. Happy that you're on your way to heaven. Smile on your face that, that makes the devil run every time you stand up. That's it. Bless God. Amen. Who else got saved? Paul liked to talk about his salvation experience. October 6, 1970, Oscar Barra. Oscar Barra, bless God. Amen. Said he go, I'll go Who said that? Phil McClellan. Phil McClellan. So that's all right. I think I know how to get real <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. That was right here at this church, too, in the long ago. Somebody else. Right here, dear. November 9th. Uh, November 11th, 2001, Dr. Phil Hoskins was preaching at Eastside Baptist Church in Wow. If you got saved under Phil Hoskins, I know it was hard. Amen. God bless you. That's wonderful. Anybody else want to talk about when you got saved? Robert? 1983, under uh, Dr. Percy Ray. Yes. Yes. That was on a Friday night, if I remember correctly. Yes, sir. We had Percy Ray. Now, if you didn't know Percy Ray, you missed out on one of the greatest blessings in all of, all of your life. He was 73 years of age at the time he came here and ran a revival. 
I don't know how many people got saved during that week. I believe it was 48 maybe. But anyhow, God came down. And that Friday night when Percy stood to preach, before he could get through, people started walking the aisle. One old boy was on his way to Myrtle Beach to get drunk. And uh, God got a hold of him. He turned around and came back and, and couldn't wait till the invitation. He came down right here and he began to weep and call on God and got saved. And it was that night that God found Robert. And when he found him, he drew a circle around him and pointed the, the cross of Jesus Christ at him and he got saved. Hallelujah. Amen. It's amazing what God can do with anybody that'll just let him have his life. Now, I've said all that to say this. Now, if you thought you were pretty good, I got news for you. You, just like Paul, fit into that verse where he says, I am the chief of sinners. If you ever get to the place where you think you're pretty good, you'd better just go back to Calvary and see what Jesus died for. For he died for the ungodly. He died for the sinner. He died for every filthy thing that's a part of your life. And though you may have walked and thought you were pretty good in your Christian or in your everyday life, and you were not an immoral person, you were just as dirty as the dirtiest person and needed the same blood that washed him clean. And Paul describes it and he says, it's the most wonderful thing in the world to know that you're saved. If you're glad you're saved, say amen. amen. So he says, I am saved. I'm called to preach. And he has given me the authority. Notice that he says, by the commandment of our God and our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's not authorized by himself nor any other organization. He is authorized by the Lord. Now, I don't want to just uh, spend too much time here, but I want you to look at the titles that Paul gives of the Lord Jesus. He, first of all, calls him Lord. Secondly, Jesus. And thirdly, Christ. Now, this is not just some names that somebody thought up, but these are the titles which are given to him by the Father himself. And so he says he is Lord. What does the word Lord mean? Well, uh, he is Lord. That is, he is the Lord of heaven. He is the creator of all things. Did you know that Jesus was Jesus before Jesus became Jesus? Jesus always has been. Jesus was before the foundations of the earth were laid. As a matter of fact, if you look back in the book of Genesis, you'll find Jesus in chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, Elohim, which is the, a plural word for God, and that includes God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I know it's so because in John chapter 1, he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and everything that is made was made by him. Without him, not anything made that was made, and he is the, the author he is the sustainer, he is the maker, the creator, and he is the one who keeps everything that there is. Hey, Jesus is God. And when he came into this world, he robed himself in flesh, he limited himself somewhat as he came, but even with one arm tied behind him, he can say to the wind, stop blowing, and the wind ceases its blowing. He can say to the blind, I give you sight, and to the deaf, I give you hearing, and to the lame, I give you freedom of movement and to the dead come up out of the grave and they come alive again. He is Lord. Don't you ever forget that Jesus is Lord. By the way, I don't know where this came from, but I'm going to throw it in anyhow. When Jesus was here, he never blessed dogs and cats and monkeys and all of that kind of thing. And the church has somehow gotten away from where God intended for us to go when they, we get involved in those kinds of things. He is Lord. Not only is he Lord, but he is Jesus. Now what is the word Jesus? That's the name Savior. In the book of Matthew, he said, his name shall be called Jesus, for he shall save his people. 
So when you talk about being saved, you can't say saved without saying Jesus. They're one and the same. You're not saved by Buddha. You're not saved by Mohammed. You're not saved by uh, the Hindu gods. You're not saved by being good. You're not saved by trying harder. You're not saved by going through the rites of the church. You're not saved by being baptized. You're not saved by being uh, good and helping the needy. You're not saved by joining the church. You're not saved by any of the things that so many put notice on. But friend, if you're saved, it's because Jesus Christ has come to live here his life inside of you. John says it this way in the epistle of 1 John chapter 5, and this is the record. God hath given unto us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Listen, he who hath the Son hath life, and he who hath not the Son of God hath not life. Salvation is not something you do. It's someone you receive. And when Jesus comes into your heart, my friend, God says you are saved. And his name is Jesus. I wish I had time to camp out there. But the third word is Christ. And the word Christ is the Hebrew word that is synonymous with the, with the Greek word for Savior. But there's a little bit more to that and as Christ, you see, he reigns over his people. I thank God that he lives in his people, but as our Christ, he reigns over his people. He is the Lord of our life. And so he gives us his titles, and then he states his mission. He says unto him, I besought you to abide at this place. Now the church needs a pastor. And I want you to note that Paul has a very affectionate feeling toward Timothy. Paul, if I understand things, is about 30 years older than Timothy. You'll remember that Timothy got saved on Paul's missionary journey. And uh, as he led him to faith in Christ, he became a mighty servant. And then he became a, a companion of Paul traveling with him. And I can imagine that as they travel together, Paul every day, day after day, opens the scripture to them as they're riding along, teaching him the things of the word of God. And when Paul goes into the synagogue to preach, there's Timothy sitting back there listening, taking notes, making sure that he's got everything together. And now there comes a time when Paul says, I need to go to Macedonia. And since God's called me over there, Timothy, the church here is in trouble. And I want you to stay and set in in order the things of the church lest the church might fall into disarray. What is it he says first of all that he is to do in the church? He says that they will teach no other doctrine. Now listen to me I know I'm old and I know that sometimes I forget things but I want to tell you there's one thing I don't want to forget and that is doctrine is important. We're living in a day where we have easy believism churches. We have churches that want to play and we have churches that put great emphasis on drama and they have uh, their uh, little ditty music, the 7-Eleven music, and uh, they uh, don't want to put emphasis on doctrine. Listen, friend, the word of the Lord was the doctrine of the early church, and the word of the Lord is the doctrine of the church today. You see, this church has a doctrine on how you're saved, salvation. How are you saved? By grace, through faith, plus nothing. And there are those, though, who tell you anything in order to try and rein people in. And they'll say you've got to be baptized to get saved. That's not in the word of God. I promise you it's not. They say uh, uh, you've got to uh, do these. And then there are those churches say you don't have to do anything. You just come. As long as you come. Dress like you want to. By the way, as long as I'm there, let me clean me out another spot. I want you to know that I know that you're not saved by the way you dress. But after you get saved, I think you ought to clean up. Amen? I don't mean just take a bath, although you ought to do that too. If, you ought to, if you're a Christian, you ought to be clean. You ought to smell nice. You don't want to offend people when you try to tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Brush your teeth. Get you some mints and put them in your mouth. And then talk to them about the Lord. But I want you to know, don't you ever let me catch you wearing a shirt that says party naked. 
I'll call you down if I do see you. Don't you wear shirts. I don't care if they give them to you. And, uh, and it's got Budweiser on the front and, and uh, uh, Miller on the back and all of those kind of advertisements for the world uh, mess. Don't dress like that. Girls, don't get your clothes so that they call attention to your sexuality, but dress neat and dress nice and uh, look nice. I'm telling you, when you come to church, you're dress up. Dress up. And men, that fits for you too. Now, I don't mean that you ought to get your dress down. Just I, I mean that a man ought to look like a man. Amen? Amen. And it won't, do, it won't hurt you. Put on a coat, wear a tie, and, uh, and let people know, I'm going to church. And get you a Bible. If you hadn't got one, come and see me. We'll get you one. But you need a Bible. You need a Bible to read it, first of all, but you need it as a witness. Amen. I heard about an old boy that had been at the town drunk. And they was having a revival meeting. He went down to the tent and one night got saved. And when he got saved, everybody was amazed. They said, he'll never live up to it. But the next day, he went out and got him a job. And uh, started working, started cleaning up, kept coming to church. And after he got his first paycheck, he went down to the, to the Christian bookstore. And he walked in and said, I, I've just been saved a few days and I want to buy me a Bible. And the man pulled out a little New Testament and laid it up on the counter. And he said, no, that's not what I want. And so he reached down and he got him a, a personal sized Bible, one about so big, laid that up. He said, no, that's not what I want either. And then he reached down and he got him a study Bible. It was a little bigger. And he said, no, that's not what I want. He said, well, what do you want then? And he pulled out a pulpit Bible and laid it up there. And he said, that's what I want. He said, man, why in the world do you want something that big? He said, I want something so big that when I'm walking down the street and some of my old gang hollers at me that I can't hide it. I want to know that I'm a Christian and I'm walking on with God. Amen. Get you a Bible. Now, you don't have to wear jewelry that says WWJD and all of those other things. If you've got that, that's all right. I'm not against that. But I want you to know, friend, you ought to advertise the one who is the owner of your soul and live it as you live every day. Well, that wasn't in the sermon, but it was good. I enjoyed it. I hope you did. Now I want you to notice that he, as he gives his purpose in verse 3, he says, Timothy, you need to stand firm. Abide in Ephesus. That means stay put. Don't run. Stand still. You see, folks, if you don't abide, you can't grow. And there are those who are just from pillar to post, here to yonder running everywhere, trying to find something, and they never really find what they're looking for. I heard an old boy had prize hogs, and he carried those hogs to the fair every year, won the blue ribbon every year, having the best hogs in the county. But something happened to his hogs, and he couldn't figure out what it was. So every day when he went down to feed his hogs, he'd carry the corn in the buckets and he'd walk up and as he got down to the lot, he'd take his pocket knife and peck on the bottom of the bucket. And the hogs would come running, he'd pour the corn into them and they'd eat it. Fine hogs. But one day a woodpecker moved in and he'd fly over and start rapping on the post and the hogs would run over to that woodpecker scare the woodpecker and he'd fly over to another post. Run all the fat off of them. Just made them, they wasn't fit for nothing. <laughs> they couldn't tell the man that fed them from some woodpecker. And that's the way a lot of preachers, or a lot of people are. They can't tell who's feeding them from some old woodpecker that's just rapping on the fence. Stand firm. Abide. Don't run away. Stay put. When the way is difficult, it's the easiest thing for the servant of God to run away from doing the will of God like Jonah did. And some of you have maybe felt like giving up. But God's word to you is stand firm.
Then he says in verse 3 that he's to speak up. He says, I charge that some, that they are charged some that they teach no other doctrine. Charge some that they should teach no other doctrine. Now folks, what this means simply is that when people are teaching wrong, that somebody has to call their hand. And so he says, Timothy, I've given you the responsibility. Now you see, Timothy couldn't do that if he didn't understand doctrine. He couldn't correct them if he didn't know what uh, he was teaching was true and what they were teaching was false. But there were other doctrines that were being taught in that church. And Paul said, Timothy, I'm leaving it with you. And you've got to speak up and stop error. Expose it for what it is and, and rebuke heresy when it comes up. And then he says in verse 4 that he is to take care. That is... Neither give heed to fables and in endless genealogies which minister questions. Take care. How easy it is for people to rush away and get caught up in fanciful teaching. Doing those things that, that may sound good and may even in some senses be good. And I want you to know that it, at one time in my own life I had to take account because I considered myself to, at one point, to be quite a student of prophecy. And I want you to know that I enjoyed studying, and I enjoyed teaching, and looking for the signs of the time. But I found myself getting one-sided. And I had to stop and say, there's more to the Word of God than just this one avenue. If you get out of balance, it's just like an old tire on a car. If it gets out of balance, it'll just jump up and down, wear you out as you try to drive. And eventually, it will destroy the tire itself. Take care that you don't get caught up in these isms and cults and strange theories that are endless. Talking about genealogies, trying to figure out whose family goes back to where. But stand firm. Don't get caught up. Lady had gone to work for a very rich woman. And the rich woman was showing her around her house and pointing out what she wanted to do and how. And she came to this one chair and she said, Now, Mandy, whatever you do, don't you sit down in that chair. It goes back to Louis the 14th. She said, Yes, ma'am, I understand. Said, I got a couch. It goes back to Sears on the 15th. <laughs> <laughs> don't get caught up in endless genealogies and then he says in verse 18 fight on this young man is told to war a good warfare this is a reminder at once that we're soldiers we're fighters and there's a war and it's a terrible war we're engaged in a stern business this is not a playhouse this is not a game. And what we do, we must do with all of our heart and with everything that we have that we might give ourselves absolutely to God. And then he says, keep true. Verse 19 and 20 is one of those passages of Scripture that I almost wish wasn't in the Word of God. But first he says, holding faith and a good conscience which some have put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. And what he means is they have made shipwreck of the church. Shipwreck of the church. I grew up in a good church, a fast-growing church. I was the first person saved in that new church on the first day that it met. And I watched it grow from a handful of people to run in more than 300 in Sunday school. I helped nail the flooring just as a teenage boy. I helped nail the flooring into that building as we built an auditorium. And I thought, man, this church will always be. But things began to fall apart. And people got mad with the preacher and got mad with one another. And they began to fall away. When I was a teenager, I directed the music in my church. 
It wasn't that I knew anything about music and it wasn't that I could sing. They just didn't have anybody else that knew how to wave his arms. And so they asked me to do that. And I directed the music. And it continued to go down and down. And a church that at one time was one of the strongest churches got down to as little as 12 in attendance. And finally the old preacher died. And they called somebody else. And he left. And they called somebody else. But finally God put some things together. And the church now is in a growing state again. And they have built a new wonderful sanctuary as they worship the Lord. But I thank God for those who stood firm. Because there were some who caused the church to fall on the rocks and to be shipwrecked. And now he points out some folks. He said, I want to tell you two of them by name. Now the reason I said this isn't here because folks, I don't like to do that. But here Paul puts his finger on two men, Hymenius and Alexander. You know that Alexander was a coppersmith. Paul said that they did great damage to him. And he was going to confront them when he got back. But you understand that these were people who were teaching false doctrine. And he says you've got to stay true. And you've got to do whatever needs to be done. Because the church is too important to allow one or two or a few or many to destroy the church. We're living in a day when the church is falling on hard times. When doctrine that once we stood upon, we're throwing out the window. Churches now are embracing homosexuality, which the Word of God absolutely says is sin. Churches are taking any kind of position and some that are unimaginable. I don't have time to go there. But I want you to know, friend, that as the pastor of this church, as long as God will give me wisdom, and God will give me strength, and God will give me the backbone, I'm always going to tell you what thus saith the Word of God. And I'm going to try to keep our ship in the middle of the channel, headed toward glory as we move forward for God. Young Timothy, whatever you do, don't forget, I've left you there. Don't leave. Stand firm. Stay the course. Command the ship. Preach the word. And as he says in 2 Timothy, be instant, in season, and out of season. Let's bow our heads.